Hello again, welcome back to my channel. In this lesson, we're going to be looking at the biochemistry behind photosynthesis. We're going to break it down into these sections. First, we're going to talk about what photosynthesis is, and then we're going to talk about where photosynthesis occurs in cells. So basically the chloroplasts and how they're adapted to their function. And then finally, we'll look at the two main stages of photosynthesis in fair detail. And we're also going to look at why each of the stages are required. So let's go into that now. So first, we'll start off by looking at some key terms that you should know in order to understand this topic. So the first is the word autotroph. So these are organisms which are capable of synthesizing complex organic molecules, for example, glucose, from simpler inorganic molecules, such as carbon dioxide and water. We'll talk more about that later. So one example of um, a process used by autotrophs is photosynthesis. So this process synthesizes complex organic molecules from simpler inorganic molecules, basically carbon dioxide and water, using energy from light. Okay, so that's a specific um, form of um, an autotrophic or autotrophic um, process. So let's go on to the next bit. What are chloroplasts? So these are the organelles responsible for the chemical reactions or processes within within photosynthesis in cells. Okay, so there at the bottom of the page, you've got an example of my incredible artistic prowess. And you can see what the structure of a chloroplast looks like. So looking at that structure, let's try to pick out three features which enable chloroplasts to carry out their function. So first, they contain a pigment called chlorophyll. required for photosynthesis. Actually, let's abbreviate that. So required for PS. Okay. 
Secondly, they have stacked phylacoids forming grana to increase surface area. We'll talk about what that surface area is required for later. And then a third feature, we'll look at the fact that they have stroma. They have the stroma, which contains enzymes required. or photosynthesis. Okay, so those are three examples of features of chloroplasts which help them to carry out their function. I've also linked there, um, just over here, a video um, on YouTube which will take you deeper into the structure of chloroplasts. So now we're going to look at the stages in photosynthesis. So the two main stages are the light dependent stage or phase and the light independent stage or phase, which is also sometimes called the Calvin cycle. And yet again, you've got um, a link there as a QR code to another relevant video, which you can watch in your own time. So let's look at the stages in the light dependent stage. So it starts off with something called the photolysis of water. So photo just means light and lysis means to split or cleave from Greek. Okay, so let's see what's going to happen to this water molecule during photolysis. It's in essence split into various bits. And they are electrons, protons. Let's make this a bit shorter. We'll see why in a minute. Protons, which are basically hydrogen ions, and then oxygen. We don't really care that much about um, the oxygen from the point of view of photosynthesis any longer. The only two bits we care about from this point on are the electrons and the protons. And we'll talk about why in a second. So the energy from light is then used to excite the electrons to a higher energy level. And then they're carried through various electron carriers, what we describe as photosystems. And we start off with photosystem two and then photosystem one. And so they carry the electrons and we'll talk about what needs to then happen with those electrons at the end. So the electrons are um, then carried from each um, photosystem to the next, from photosystem two to photosystem one. And as they go from photosystem two to photosystem one, energy is released, which is used to phosphorylate ADP to ATP. We'll talk more about why that's relevant later. 
the electrons are then reassociated with their protons and that then forms hydrogen which is used to reduce something called NADP. So you'll end up with reduced NADP. And so those are the two products we need for the next stage of photosynthesis. So let's do a quick recap. We start off with water being split in a process called photolysis into its component parts. You'll end up with oxygen, hydrogen ions or protons, and electrons. The electrons are then excited to a high energy level and then move through a sequence of um, electron carriers, in this case photosystem 2 and photosystem 1. As the electrons go from photosystem 2 to photosystem 1, energy is released, bringing about the phosphorylation of ADP to ATP. ATP is the first of the products we need for the next stage, the light independent stage. And then, further on in the process, the electrons are reassociated with their protons, forming hydrogen, which is used to reduce NADP. So reduced NADP is the second product we need for the next stage. So now we have the two products we need. Now I've shown the exact same process, but slightly differently, in this diagram. So you can see the electrons as they move along after the photolysis of water, which is here. It would be helpful if you can actually see that. So you've got photolysis of water there. And then you've got the oxygen, which we talked about. We've got the protons or hydrogen ions and then we've got the electrons and you can see that the electrons go to photosystem 2 and then on to photosystem 1 and then right at the end you've got the two products we need which are reduced NADP and ATP so let's write down what photolysis is. So this process splits water molecules into protons electrons and oxygen using energy from light. Okay, so that's photolysis. Now let's go on to the next page. So as I said earlier, you've got the products of the light dependent stage, which are relevant. Okay, I said we had oxygen, which we no longer care about. Then we also had um, reduced NADP. And we also had ATP. So the products of the light dependent stage reduced NADP, ATP, and oxygen. So I did say that we no longer care about oxygen from the point of view of photosynthesis. However, the oxygen is still relevant um, to the organism. 
So what is it that could happen to um, the oxygen from the light dependent stage? There are two options. First, it could um, simply be used by the plant cells for respiration. So it could be used for respiration. Or secondly, it could simply be removed from the plant and um, sent off into the air. So released from plant or food synthetic or whatever food synthetic, synthetic organism into the air. Obviously that's beneficial for us because um, it ensures that there's enough oxygen in the air for us to breathe or well for us to respire. Okay so let's go on to the next bit. What is photophosphorylation? And basically um, it's the synthesis of ATP using energy from light. Okay, so there are two main forms of photophosphorylation, as you can see in the diagram. You've got non-cyclic and you've got cyclic photophosphorylation. In this diagram, the non-cyclic photophosphorylation is shown as solid purple lines or arrows, and the cyclic um, photophosphorylation is shown as broken purple lines or arrows, as you can see in the key which I have shown at the bottom of the diagram. So what's the difference between non-cyclic and cyclic photophosphorylation? Let's have a look at the picture. So in non-cyclic photophosphorylation, the electrons are carried all the way to the terminal electron acceptors, which are the protons. Okay, so electrons are carried all the way to the terminal electron acceptors protons to eventually reduce NADP. Okay, how about cyclic photophosphorylation? So cyclic photophosphorylation, as you can see in the picture, um, causes electrons to move between carriers without eventually binding or combining, let's say combining with protons. Why would um, the plant cell do this? Why would you um, have cyclic photophosphorylation like this without passing on the electrons to the terminal um, electron acceptors, the protons? The reason is to generate more ATP. So this helps to generate more ATP. So the plant cell can generate as much ATP as it requires for the next stage in photosynthesis. So that's what photophosphorylation is. 
So let's go on to the next stage, the light independent stage of photosynthesis. Where does the light independent stage of photosynthesis take place in chloroplasts? I um, mentioned earlier when we looked at the structure of chloroplasts that there are there's a bit of the chloroplast called the stroma. The stroma contains the enzymes responsible for the light independent stage. So it takes place in the stroma. And the light independent stage of photosynthesis is also known as the Calvin cycle. Okay, so earlier we talked about the two products of the light dependent stage which were relevant. The two products were ATP and reduced NADP. Here we're going to talk about where they are actually used in the next stage, the light independent phase. So I like to draw this as a sort of cycle. So let's have a look here at what that cycle would look like. So there's the cycle. You've got um, RUBP, which is short for ribulose bisphosphate, and it contains five carbon atoms. And then you've got two molecules of GP, which have three carbon atoms each. And then you'll end up with TP, at the end of it, which also contains three carbon atoms. So that's the Calvin cycle. Okay, so where do ATP and um, reduced NADP slot into this? They come in here, the step between GP and TP. So you've got ADP going to, I'm sorry, you've got ATP going to ADP, and then you've got reduced NADP going to NADP. Okay, so at the end of that, you'll end up with TP, and then the TP can then be used either to synthesize, synthesize more complex molecules e.g. glucose, or simply sent back through the cycle to start again. So what is it that enables this step here between RUBP and GP? You need an enzyme called Rubisco. Sounds pretty cool, a bit like Disco. So Rubisco. Okay. And you also need something else. Can you figure out what that other thing might be? I'll give you a second. You've gone from a five carbon molecule to two three carbon molecules. There's something missing, isn't there? You need another carbon. And that comes from CO2. So that's where the CO2 is required in the process. CO2 provides the carbon that's required for RUBP to go to GP. And that is the Calvin cycle in a nutshell. 
So let's have a look at this going forward. So what two substances from the light dependent stage are required for the light independent stage? So yet another reminder, repetition is great. It ensures that you remember all of this information. So you've got ATP and then you've got reduced NADP. So actually, let's think about why it's reduced. So there are various definitions of reduction. One is adding um, hydrogen, which is what's happening in this case. So something can be reduced by adding, adding um, hydrogen atoms to a molecule. But there are two other um, definitions you can have for reduction. Another is the removal of oxygen um, from a molecule. And then finally, um, a great way to remember the last one is the acronym OIL rig. And oxidation is loss, reduction is gain of electrons. So the gain of electrons would reduce um, a molecule. In this case, it's mainly to do with the fact that we've added hydrogen onto NADP. Okay, so finally, we've got the different stages of the Calvin cycle in a bit more depth. Let's have a look at how this works. So you can see that the diagram is drawn slightly differently compared to the way I drew it originally. This will often happen in questions. You need to understand the first principles rather than trying to cram um, a diagram. That way you can always um, figure out what a diagram is trying to show you rather than trying to um, cram one thing and then not being able to relate it to a slightly different diagram. So if we have a look, it's exactly the same. It's just drawn um, rather than being anti-clockwise in my diagram, it's drawn clockwise and it has the same starting point, RUBP up here. Okay, and as I showed you in my diagram, the RUBP goes to GP using an enzyme called Rubisco, and it also requires carbon dioxide as shown in the diagram. Then the next stage is GP going to TP. And as I told you before, this is where the products of the light dependent stage are required, the reduced NADP and the ATP. And that's what enables the GP to go to TP. And then the TP can either go back to reform more RUBP, or it can be used to make complex molecules, as you can see in the picture. So let's go through the numbered steps. Number one. Okay, so I've labeled number one. Um, if you could, you could order this in whatever way you want, but I've labeled it as CO2 being required. CO2 is used to convert RUBP, which has five carbons, to two GP molecules, which each have three carbons. Okay, and as such, there's a deficit of carbons, and the carbon dioxide is what supplies the extra carbon required. Then you have the next stage, which is Rubisco. So Rubisco is the enzyme needed in order to bring about the conversion of RUBP 
to GP. Okay, so the third stage is that conversion of RUBP to GP. And then we can go on to step number four, if I can find it, there we go. So step number four, the two products of the light dependent phase ATP ATP and reduced NADP are used here. So let's go on to number five. So number five is the conversion of um, TP back to RUBP. So number five, TP can be converted back into RUBP to restart the process. Okay, so let's go to number six. So we can now start talking about the complex molecules which can be made from this process. So you can see that GP can be used to make amino acids and fatty acids. So it can be used as a precursor to make fatty acids or amino acids. So you've been taught in the past, the GCSE, that um, photosynthesis is all about making glucose, but actually it's a lot more complicated than that. Plants need more than glucose. They need lots of different complex biological molecules, all of which can be made using photosynthesis. Okay, so we've got um, number six there. Let's go on to number seven. TP can be used to make hexo sugars. So that's the more um, familiar process to you. So TP can be used to make hexose sugars, e.g. glucose. I'm probably not going to be able to fit every single step into um, the space I've provided. So I'll just um, list the main ones and then just discuss the others. Um, so next, let's look at which one is labeled eight in the diagram. So eight, um, nine and 10 are all um, carbohydrates, which can then be made from the hexo sugars either by um, changing um, glucose into a different isomer. And you can go back to my video on carbohydrates um, to talk to look back at what isomers are. Or you can also make uh, more complex polysaccharides like starch and cellulose. So let's write that down. So hexose is from seven can be used to make other carbohydrates. So that was um, steps eight through to 10. So let's put that in 
rather than just putting in eight, we can go eight. Quite helpful to be able to see it. Eight to 10. So we've gone eight through 10 quite rapidly. And then finally, you've got 11 A and B. So step 11, in essence, they're all um, linked to each other. So um, as you can see there, the TP can be used to make glycerol, which is a component of lipids along with fatty acids. And we came across fatty acids before because fatty acids can be made from GP. So that is the process and um, rather conveniently it all fits quite nicely into the space um, provided. So those are the steps involved. Do you need to know this much detail? No. You should never cram any information. You should learn this stuff from first principles. The more often you look back at your notes and rewatch these videos or whatever sources of information, the more likely you are to remember all of this. Okay, so that is that with regard to filling in the notes section of the worksheet. You can do some questions which I have attached at the end in your own time. Okay, so let's go on to a summary of what we've done so far. So there's a summary of the biochemistry of food synthesis. Now this video is getting quite long, so I'm not going to read through all of this. I'll just leave it on the screen for a few more seconds. You can pause it and you can read through these yourself. And those um, are basically the summary steps of the um, content in this video. Okay, so. I think it's always a good idea, as I've already said, for you to go over material as many times as possible. The more often you do, the more likely you are to retain information. And to that end, it's probably a good idea to rewatch this video again, and in the future to refill the worksheet again whilst watching the video. Eventually, you should be able to get to a stage where you can refill the worksheet from memory without having to watch the video. I hope you found this video useful. If you did, could you please press the like button at the bottom? And if you haven't already, you should subscribe so that you get notified if I or when I add future videos. Thank you very much for watching.